Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to um, introduce Emily Charlier today. So she's, she's working at Uliège in Belgium, and she's going to talk about regular sequences in abstract numeration systems, which is a joint work with uh, Celia Cisternino and myself. Emily, you can go. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I don't see you, so don't hesitate to, to interrupt me. Uh, um, and I, I will listen to your question, but I, I cannot see the, the chat. So uh, let, let's do like this. So uh, but thank you very much uh, for introducing me, Manon, and also for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, so uh, the aim of this talk is to present an, uh, an alternative notion of regular sequences in abstract enumeration systems. In fact, uh, such uh, sequences were already considered uh, by Michel Rigaud and Arnaud Mas. Uh, and they, here in this talk, I will give uh, another definition of, of this notion, uh, which does not coincide uh, with theirs. And I will uh, justify myself, why, why uh, are we doing such a thing? In fact, it's uh, because we, we, in this way, we can um, generalize uh, many of the well-known characterization of irregular sequences, uh, something, uh, I mean, which, which uh, uh, Michel and uh, Arnaud were not able to do with their definitions. So, um, uh, my talk uh, has seven parts. I'm not sure I will be able to go through uh, all the parts, but it does not really matter. I will go uh, uh, as far as I can. So um, in my first part, I want just to define regular sequences in, in this context of abstract enumeration systems. So uh, I, I recall the definition of an abstract enumeration system is just a way to represent natural uh, numbers by words. And how uh, do we do that? So uh, we, we say that um, uh, an abstract enumeration system is just given by uh, a triplet, L, A, and an order on the alphabet A. L is an infinite regular language uh, and over uh, the totally ordered alphabet A. So uh, this means that the words in, in A uh, will be ordered in a total order two, and the, the, the natural n will be represented by the nth word uh, in the uh, infinite language L. So the order we consider uh, over the alphabet L uh, is just the radix order, also sometimes called a genealogical order, uh, which is induced by the total order on the alphabet. So this means that we um, order the, the words length by length, and within each length, we choose uh, the lexicographic order. And the S value function is then uh, just the reciprocal map of the representation function. So this definition uh, 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 was uh, given in, the, in a paper by Le Comte and Rigaud in 2001. So in this talk, I will uh, always uh, consider this uh, particular abstract immersion systems in order to illustrate the notion I introduced. So uh, this, in fact, was the, the original example of the paper of Le Comte and Rigaud. And it has uh, several ad advantages because it's a very simple uh, regular language, A star, uh, B star. Uh, this language is prefix closed. So we will see uh, that it will be important uh, uh, for obtaining the, the characterization later on. Uh, and also it's, uh, uh, it's a language that is, it's a numeration system that is not uh, a positional numeration system. So it has some new phenomena occurring in this kind of abstract numeration system that do not occur in, um, in usual uh, numeration systems such as uh, integer base B numeration systems or, or uh, the Zeckendorf numeration systems. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting uh, example. And also uh, the, the last property it has, it's, uh, it is that uh, the, the, the number, uh, well, it grows polynomially. So the number of words uh, of each length, length n uh, is, is just n plus one, uh, in fact. So it's just, uh, it's a polynomial where, while uh, in general, when you consider integer base B enumeration systems, you get exponential uh, growth of the languages. 
So uh, here in this uh, example, then uh, you 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 see that uh, words uh, over um, sorry over um, I don't. Yeah, uh, the, the words of the languages are order length by length. So you see that you have the word of length zero epsilon, then the words of length one A and B, and then the words of length two and then length three. And within each length, we consider the lexicographic order. So you see that, for example, 17 uh, is uh, represented by the word A, 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 B, B. And so if you, this example is also very simple since uh, it's not really complicated to see that uh, if you, you have a, a, an arbitrary word in your language, A to the P, B to the Q, then you can actually compute uh, the value of, of this word by this uh, simple formula. So, um, as I said already several times, uh, the, 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 the numeration, the abstract numeration system uh, notion generalized that of integer B numeration systems, also the second of numeration system. And this is why the, and, and um, this is because, uh, sorry, this is because the, the uh, numeration language, so the set of all uh, representations is uh, in fact uh, a regular language and uh, the, the order of the integer is uh, co exactly correspond to the radix order of the words in these uh, languages. So the same holds for the second of numeration systems and actually for any positional numeration systems, so that is based on a sequence of integer u and uh, that has a regular numeration language. And so it is also known if you if you know about uh, such systems too, and uh, that if the system has a, 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 the property to be piso, uh, it means uh, that it is uh, based on a sequence that satisfies a, a linear recurrence uh, uh, that, uh, whose uh, characteristic polynomial is the the minimal polynomial of a piso number. In that case. Uh, we know that the numeration language is regular. This is a result uh, due, to, due to Christian Fruny. And so uh, this is also included in the, in the class of abstract numeration systems. So uh, in this talk, uh, I will be interested by representing elements of N to the D. So this means that I will work in a D-dimensional framework. And so for each component of my D tuples of integers, I will uh, consider uh, a specific numeration system as I, right? So I actually have D uh, abstract numeration system S1 to SD. And so my D dimensional numeration system is the, the numeration system S, which is denoted here as bold, uh, which is a list of these numeration systems. So uh, in order, to represent uh, D tuples of uh, word uh, of integers, sorry, by a uh, word, uh, as usual, it's a little boring slide, but it's really the usual thing to do. Then what you you have to do is to pad uh, your your representation by a, a special symbol sharp. So here we choose the, uh, the special uh, symbol to be the sharp symbol, whatever. It's just a symbol that does not belong to any of the uh, alphabets uh, AI. And so if you have a D-tuple uh, uh, of words uh, and each component is a word over the alphabet AI, then when you pad uh, this D-tuple, what you get is actually a word over an alphabet A, which is a D-dimensional alphabet. Uh, which is given uh, here. So this A bold uh, is called the, the numeration alphabet and it's actually uh, the, the Cartesian product of all uh, the alphabets AI uh, and on each component you add the, the possibility of putting the symbol sharp, but you don't want to see the symbol sharp on every component uh, at the same time. So you remove the letter uh, sharp, 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 sharp D times. Okay, so we have defined this uh, D-dimensional uh, abstract numeration systems and the D-dimensional alphabet. Now we, we also define a D-dimensional numeration language, which is uh, denoted L uh, bold too. And it's simply the Cartesian product of the D uh, numeration language that you have. Uh, and you have, of 
course to 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 pad your representation in order to to get a real language over the alphabet at uh, a and uh, since you started with the um, abstract numeration systems, the, your, your languages L1 to LD are all regular, and so L is also a regular language over A. And so we adapt the notation, wrap S and val S to this context by uh, the, the, the natural uh, uh, setting. So uh, wrap S of uh, the tuple of uh, natural numbers is just, you, what, what you do is you represent each component in, your, in the, the abstract numeration system that uh, correspond to the, 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 the components you're looking at, and then you, you, you pad uh, your words in order to have a, a D words of the same length. And for the value function, when you have a D tuple of words, what you do is that, well, you, you, you have your, 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 your D tuple, but your, your, since you have a, an element of L, you have D words of the same length. So it might be that you have those uh, sharp uh, symbols in front of your words. So what you do is you remove your sharp symbols and then evaluate it in evaluate each component in the corresponding abstract numeration system. Sorry. Okay. So this is really the classical uh, framework in order to to be able to to represent details of, of uh, integers. Uh, so if we go back to our running example, uh, what I will do is I will uh, consider D equal to two. So I will put myself in dimension two and each component of my system will be the same uh, numeration system. So here in my previous slides, I could have D abstract numeration system, D different abstract numeration system, S1 to SD. But here I have uh, two um, numeration system, which are both equal to this A star, B star numeration system. So my alphabet now, my two dimensional alphabet is given here. So it's all pair of letters uh, with A, B or sharp in each component. Uh, but uh, this I don't allow to have the letter sharp sharp. And my, my language is if I look at four and nine, the pair of integer four and nine, how uh, I will get this, this uh, representation uh, given here. So how do I do that? I say, okay, four is represented by the word AB. Nine is represented by the word BBB. So since they are not of the same length, I have to pad the first component with one sharp on the left. You know, and in doing so, I get uh, a word over the D-dimensional alphabet A. So I have to, to separate uh, my, my letters component um, by, by column here. So I have the first letter, which is sharp B, then AB, then BB. And uh, when I want to evaluate uh, this word over the alphabet L, so the word is first component is A, A, B, and the second component is sharp, sharp, A. So this is a word over the, L, the numeration language L. Well, when I evaluate this, well, I evaluate each component separately. And I first, uh, of course, remove uh, the sharp symbol in front of the A's. So I get the, the, the pair of integers 7, 1. Okay, so this is uh, the context we are uh, working in. And now I can uh, give our uh, definition of regular sequences. So here I, I presented the part, so I, I am talking about SK regular sequences. I've uh, just defined what is this S bold, so this uh, D-dimensional abstract numeration systems. The K here refers to an arbitrary commutative summary ring. So everywhere in my talk, uh, this uh, will be a fixed arbitrary commutative summary ring. So you can just, in general, think of n, for example, the natural numbers, but there is no reason to consider uh, a particular uh, commutative summary ring. And the sequence, so uh, f, so that is a multi-dimensional sequence uh, over k, okay, is called sk regular if the series sf is k recognizable and the series sf is this series here. So this is uh, the coefficient of a word 
that does not belong to the numeration language is zero. And the coefficient of a word in L is given by, uh, so uh, the, the, the function F, the sequence F evaluated in val S of W, which exists since W is uh, in my language. So maybe not all of you uh, is um, familiar with uh, formal series and K-recognizable formal series. So I give a, here a slide, a slide uh, with some background uh, on, this, uh, on this subject. So here, what I call a series is just an application from A star to K. And the image of a word is uh, denoted in this uh, maybe strange way if you've never seen that. So it's, it's SW between parentheses. So this uh, image is also called the coefficient of the word W in the series. And the series is usually denoted in this way in the center of the slide. So this is a sum over all W uh, uh, in A star of the word W and in front of W, you, you, you put the, the coefficient of W in the series S. So a series like this is said to be K recognizable if the coefficient uh, of a word A1 to AL is uh, computed thanks to a matrix product, lambda mu uh, of A1 times ta 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 until mu of AL times gamma where lambda is a row vector, gamma is a column vector, and for each letter A in A, mu of A is a square matrix with coefficients in A, right? So if we have uh, such lambda, mu, and gamma, then we say that this series is K recognizable and the tri triple L mu gamma is called a linear representation of S. Okay, so if we go back to our definition of regular sequences, uh, this means that the, 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 the coefficient here, f of value uh, s of w, is computed thanks to uh, a matrix product in, the, in this way. And you get the, the, um, uh, the value zero if the, the word w does not belong to your language. Now. Okay, so if we uh, consider again this running example, we have uh, these two dimensional numeration systems, uh, system S, with, where uh, each component is uh, the, the numeration system A star, B star. And you consider a two dimensional uh, sequence over N. So here my uh, simmering K is N. And uh, the sequence uh, associated with a pair uh, of integers M, N the maximum of the common suffixes of the representations of M and N, right? So just a, a, an easy example to illustrate the notion. So the associated series SF uh, can be computed in the following way. So the coefficient of a word in the language is given by uh, the coefficient of the word W in the series S which you can kind of forget the numeration system. You say that the series S is just a series from A star to N uh, that uh, with uh, uh, a word U, V over uh, your two dimensional alphabet A associates um, uh, the maximum of the common, the uh, maximum of the length, sorry, of the common suffixes of U and V. Right, so it's easily seen that you, you have this property. And here I'm a little loose maybe, but since L is a regular language, uh, it's well known that the series SF will be unrecognizable is if uh, the series S is, right? It's a kind of just a projection on words uh, over, um, a projection to the, the words in L, which is a regular language. And so if I can find a linear representation of S, then I will know that S is N recognizable. And so SF is N recognizable and hence uh, the, the sequence F is SN regular. And so uh, here I give a linear representation of S of dimension two. So I have two by two matrices. So my uh, uh, row vector lambda is zero one. My column vector gamma is one zero, 
And so the image uh, of the letter AA and the letter BB is the same matrix 1011. And the image of any other letter in the alphabet is the matrix 0001. So you can easily verify that uh, this is actually a linear representation of X. So this is an example of an SN regular sequence. Okay. <clears throat> so um, now uh, I, I want to say a word of this uh, D-dimensional framework. I could have presented every uh, thing and all the notions here in a unidimensional framework, but we really chose to, to work uh, in this multidimensional framework. Because in fact, there is uh, no um, uh, equivalence between, uh, uh, well, it, it, it's really something uh, a little bit trickier in two dimensional than in unidimensional framework. So, uh, and the reason is this uh, padding of, of the representation. So if we, so here I, I uh, in the slides I presented to you, I chose to pad the representation on the left Right, but if we had taken the convention to pad representation on the right instead, instead we would get a different notion of regular sequences. Okay, and in fact, in the unit dimensional case, the two notions coincide because there is no padding in the uni dimension uni dimensional case. But when you go to a, a higher dimension, there is no such nice uh, analogy. So the two notions do not coincide. It might be that uh, uh, a left regular sequence is not a right regular sequence or vice versa, right? So I, I will uh, go back to this uh, consideration uh, later on too, uh, in order to illustrate our characterization and see what happens when we consider uh, padding on the right or padding on the left. Okay, so now I will present an alternative notion of S kernel. So uh, regular sequences are usually um, characterized in terms of the kernel of the sequence. And so here, what is right notion of kernel of the sequence that will allow us to, to characterize uh, this uh, new definition of, of uh, S regular sequences. So first I will uh, make a restriction, a working hypothesis. Uh, it is that the numeration system uh, the num has a numeration language that is prefix closed. So meaning that if I have a word uh, in my language, all prefixes must also uh, belong to the same language. Okay. And uh, in my D-dimensional framework, it uh, amounts to asking that all the languages L1 to LD are, are prefix closed, okay? And so if you think of it, it's the case of my language A star B star. It's also the case in the integer base B numeration system and the conduct numeration system. So it's not too um, terrible to ask such a, a thing. And I will also uh, try to emphasize where uh, it is used uh, in the characterization later on. Okay, so we work under this uh, working hypothesis. And now uh, I'm defining the S kernel of a sequence F. So I take a, a sequence, a multidimensional uh, sequence F over uh, K. And uh, I will define an action uh, uh, on F by a word over the alphabet A. So I write F circle W, where W is a word over A. Uh, it's a new sequence. So d-dimensional sequence over k that is defined in this way. So for each uh, n in nd, the, the image uh, of n is, uh, is here. So I have to, to separate two cases. So what I do is I, I uh, look at the representation of uh, my D triple N in my uh, abstract numeration system S, and I concatenate W on the right. And two cases are possible. Either this concatenation belong to my numeration language or it does not belong to my numeration language. So if it does belong to my numeration language, it means that I can compute the value in my system. And this is what I do. And then I evaluate my uh, function, my, my, my sequence F, 
uh, in the obtained um, uh, value. Right, and if I can't, so if the the, the concatenation rep s of n w does not belong to the numeration language, then I put a zero. Okay, and the s kernel of f is the set of all these sequences f circle w. So this notation and these considerations generalize ideas from uh, Bersel and Rottenauer, the, their book from 2011, where they added uh, a I think it's chapter five, where uh, they develop these uh, these uh, kind of ideas in for in with the aim of um, characterizing B regular sequences. So they don't have these um, conditions. Uh, so so these pretests to make in order to evaluate their their uh, function f circle w because by, if you are in um, in uh, integer B enumeration system, then you never have a problem to be or not to be in the language when you concatenate any word uh, on the right of a representation, then you are still a uh, uh, greedy representation, so you are still in your enumeration language in any case, right, so you don't have to make this distinction that we uh, have to, to make here, right. So, uh, in our example. So we, we work with A star, B star. So it means then when I will uh, compute, uh, I take the, the, my, my uh, previous uh, uh, N regular function, N regular sequence F. And when I concatenate uh, the representation of N with Bs, I'm still in my numeration language because for any word in A star B star, W, W, WB still belongs to A star B star. So what do I do? It means that I, I'm adding a uh, length one suffix, common suffix to my, to my representations. So it means that if you remember the definition of the function F, which, which was computing the, the maximum length of the common prefixes in the representations of my components, I'm just adding one to this function, right? So if I do the same, so I, I, I want to, to see what is the, the function uh, F circle AB AB. Well, I can create some problems since when I concatenate AB to a representation uh, of uh, an integer, I can uh, not anymore uh, belong to my uh, immersion language. So here in the table in the slide, I consider uh, four values of 4n. So the pairs 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 2, and 3, uh, 6, 3, sorry. So uh, the first line is the representation of these uh, pair of uh, integers. And the second line is a concatenation with uh, my uh, word ABAB, right? And in doing so, I can get uh, some words, for example, for, for the, the pair one, two, what I get is AAB, BAB, but BAB does not belong to A star, B star. So it means that I am not in the numeration language anymore. So I cannot compute the value of this, uh, this, um, this word. And so this means that the, the value of the corresponding function will be zero. This is uh, the convention we took, the definition we, 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 we chose, right? This is the same for the pair three, two. I obtain some word which does not belong anymore to my numeration language, so I also put a zero. But in the case of zero, one and six, three, then when I concatenate A, B and A, B so on, on each component, what I get is still a word of uh, my numeration language, so I can compute the value. And so when I compute my function, I'm just looking at the second row and I'm just looking at the, the length of the maximum common uh, suffixes. So for zero one, the, 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 the common suffixes is AB. This is the longest common suffixes between those two representations. So uh, the obtained value is two. While when I look at the, the pair six, three, I get uh, that the, com the longest common suffix is AAAB. So the maximum length is four, which is the value of my function. Okay, so 
Now uh, I, I am going back to my consideration of this left-right duality, as would say uh, Jacques. Um, um, so what do I mean? I mean here that uh, I chose, so I am going maybe back to this, uh, I cannot point, so it's a little bit boring, but here in the middle, when I define my F circle W, I, I can catenate W on the right of the representation of N. So this means that I could consider this operation as a right uh, action, and then the S kernel that I obtain uh, should be, could be qualified as a right kernel of uh, the, thing, the, the sequence F. So, uh, but this is, this choice uh, is uh, arbitrary. So I could also consider the, the left version of the kernel by saying that instead of um, concatenating W uh, to the right of the representation of N, I will concatenate them in front, so to the left, right? And so, of course, I have the, the, the pretest that uh, is uh, accordingly uh, defined. So I want to dub that W rep S of N belongs to my language and not uh, the other way around. And so uh, what I get uh, is um, a different uh, definition of kernel. I have a different set of, of sequences actually. And, uh, but I could work in this framework as well, but then uh, if I did that, I, had, I would have to pad my representation with the letter sharps on the right, while I, I, I chose to did it on the left. And my working hypothesis should be that my language is suffix closed instead of prefix closed, right? But provided that these conventions are taken, the results that I will present afterwards uh, can be all, uh, all can be adapted to the left version of the kernel and the left version of the regular sequences. So these conventions I've taken here, so the, the, the right version of the kernel really correspond to the left padding and the right uh, notion of regular sequences. So a left padding will indeed correspond to a right uh, regular sequences re notion and the uh, right padding will correspond to a left uh, regular sequences notion. Okay. So I won't, I won't go back to these considerations. It's just to say that when I, I am not in the unit dimensional case, I really have to, to take care of these paddings in the correct way. Otherwise I, I cannot make uh, things work. So now I will give to you three characterization of regular sequences that really uh, generalize those of B regular sequences. So if you know them already in the context of B regular sequences, you, you shouldn't be uh, too, uh, surprised, it's really uh, the, the nice uh, generalization that occur here. So uh, first, before giving the first characterization, I give one more uh, definition, is the notion of stability of a K submodule of K to the N to the D. So K to the N to the D is just the set of uh, multidimensional, so D-dimensional sequences uh, with value in K, okay? And so since I said I, I, I'm working with a, an arbitrary commutative summary ring, I am not able to work with K vector space, right? I'm not with a field. So anyway, it does not really matter. I'm working with K models and K sub models, which just mean that we are uh, looking at linear combinations with coefficients in K. And so such a K sub model of the sets of my uh, D-dimensional uh, sequences over K is called stable if it is closed under all my operation, all my action F circle W, right? If I have a sequence F in my submodule, then for all W, F circle W should also belong to my uh, K submodule. So, okay, so now the, the, the statement is as follows. A sequence F is SK regular if and only if there exists a stable, finitely generated case or model that contains F, right? And so this proves, if you think a bit, uh, so I'm not presenting the argument of the proof, so the, this proof will, in fact, generalize ideas from Bersen and Rotonawa. We really have to deal with our enumeration language everywhere. And so um, we have to, to, to 
since we, I have a regular enumeration language, I, I will have to deal with a certain number of, of quotients of this legal, regular enumeration language. While when I was with um, an integer base B enumeration system, I just I, I had just have to deal with one quotient. So this is the main difference, I think, uh, between uh, the, the, the two proofs. And the proof is really constrictive. So in the sense that if I have um, uh, a linear representation of my uh, series SF, so by definition, of, uh, S is regular if the series SF uh, is uh, K recognizable, so I have this nice uh, linear representation, I can construct uh, a finite number of generators of such a stable uh, submodule containing F. And the other way around, it works also. So if I have my finite numbers of generators, then I will be able to uh, effectively compute my linear uh, representation of my series SF. Okay. And so the proof here really relies on the property that uh, first my language is prefix closed. This is essential in the proof. And also the fact that for all uh, word U and V and, and sequence F, we have the, this property of associativity of, um, of this uh, action of on, from, on my sequences. So F circle V circle U is the same as F circle U V, right? And so this property is essential here. And this is a property that is lacking in, in the, the paper of Rigo and Mass, because if you look at, uh, at their definition of S kernel, you cannot recover this property from their definition. There is a, uh, something that, that cannot be improved there. So you really have to, to, to get a, an, another definition in order to, to get this property working and then uh, get, uh, obtaining this, uh, this characterization. Okay, so this is the first characterization I wanted to talk about. So here is the second characterization. Maybe uh, it's um, uh, more common to you, I don't know. So it's really a practical criterion for uh, K regularity. So it says that a sequence uh, is uh, as K regular if and only if there is a, a finite number of sequences, F1 to FR, such that F is F1. And for all letter in my alphabet A, when I compute, when I look at my uh, action uh, fi circle a, I can express uh, this uh, all these uh, sequences as linear combination of my original uh, sequences fi. Okay, and so it's an if and only if, right? So I will illustrate this uh, result on my uh, running example. So. I uh, have my sequence F, right? And I modify it a bit to define this sequence G. Okay, so G is F of N, so G of N is F of N if N uh, has only A's in the representation, in, in the S representation, and it's zero otherwise. And then I define eight uh, characteristic function uh, depending on whether the, the, the the components belong or don't belongs to val s of a star or, or just zero, right? And so if I take these 10 uh, sequences uh, together, uh, I can show that they satisfy the second characterization I just gave. So what do I have to show? I have to show that for any letter A in my alphabet, F circle A can be expressed as a linear combination of these 10 functions. Well, it depends, of course, of the letter A. So if, if the letter A is AA, then I will get G plus this characteristic function. So it's the N linear combination of two of the function of my 10 functions. If the letter F uh, is the letter A, sorry, is BB, then I get F plus one, as, as we already uh, said, right? So it's also uh, a linear combination of uh, my 10 sequences and in any other cases I get zero. The same holds for G uh, circle A. So if the letter A is AA, then I get G plus this characteristic uh, function and I get zero otherwise. And for my eight 
characteristic function. They can be expressed as um, this chi x1 times x2, where x1 and x2 are either 0 and or this value of a star. And we ask that not both x1 and x2 are equal to 0, because it's not uh, in my uh, 10 functions. When I look at this uh, characteristic function circle A, I get another of, uh, of the, these eight characteristic function where the sets uh, Y1 and Y2 are obtained accordingly. So they, of course, depends on X1, X2 and um, the little a. Okay, so I can express each, uh, so I, if I take back my, my uh, result, uh, this fi circle a can be expressed as a linear combination of these uh, 10 functions. Okay, so if you think of this uh, effectiveness of the proof, then what in, in fact that you what you have is that these 10 um, function will correspond to uh, 10 generators of uh, uh, a stable uh, submodule containing the, the, the function f. And so it also means that it corresponds to 10 generators of a submodule uh, that is stable and that contains the series sf. So it means that you can come um, <clears throat> from this uh, proof that you can uh, actually compute a linear representation uh, of uh, the series sf that is uh, of dimension 10. And maybe if you know, so I'm not going into the details of this slide if you don't know, but if you know that a linear uh, representation uh, of a series actually correspond to a, a weighted automaton, then here what you get is an N automaton that, recognize, uh, that recognizes the, the series as F, right? So, and the 10 states corresponds to these 10 functions uh, that I gave uh, in the slide before. Okay. Okay, so this third characterization uh, I am um, presenting here uh, is um, in a particular case. Uh, so it's, it's valid when K is a finite semi-ring or is actually a ring. So if you think of the semi-ring N, it won't work in that case. And I will illustrate the, this fact uh, in my next slide. Okay, so you really need to have either a finite semi-ring or a ring. And so uh, this characterization is also uh, well known in the case of uh, B-regular sequences. In fact, here we are interested in knowing if the, um, the K submodule generated by the kernel itself is or is not finitely generated, right? We, we haven't said that it is finitely generated because in fact, it's not in general. So this case of model is stable. So this you can prove. So this means that it is a smaller stable case of model of K to the N to the D containing F, okay? But in general, if K is an arbitrary commutative summary ring, it is not finitely generated. And so the following theorem says that if K is finite or is ring, then, uh, and you, you start with a, a K regular uh, sequence, then uh, the K submodule generated by the kernel is indeed finitely generated. And the other way around, you don't need this extra uh, hypothesis of uh, finiteness or uh, being a ring, right? If K uh, is this, uh, uh, case of model is finitely generated that in particular it's a stable case of model that is sta uh, stable finitely generated and contains f which means that f is a scale regular by the the first characterization okay so uh, let's illustrate this with our running example in fact if you consider the n submodule generated by the elements of the kernel in this case what you get is that is indeed not finitely generated. So in order to see that, uh, you have to, to, to compute uh, the elements of the kernel. So you, you first observe that you, if you compute F circle W, uh, where W is not of the form A, A star, B, B star, then what you get is always zero. If you compute F 
circle W where W is of the form BB to the K, what you get is F plus K. It's just a generalization of the argument we gave before when you had just a F circle BB and you, we, we got F plus one, right? And now if you take a word in A, A star, B, B star, but you have at least one times the letter A, A, so you have here a K greater than O equal to one and any K prime, you have F circle this, uh, word a a to the k b b to the k prime well when you compute this function what you get is the formula here on the right right and uh you can show uh, it's a, a little uh, computation that you cannot express uh, all elements in the kernel as a linear uh, n linear combination and uh, of a finite number of elements of the kernel Okay, so your, your, your answer model here is not finitely generated. But however, you know that since your, your, your sequence is actually Sn regular, we've shown that, it's also Sz regular, yes? Because uh, we, we have uh, matrices with coefficients in N, we also have matrices with coefficients in Z. So it's also Sz regular. And so our third characterization, uh, the one I just gave to you implies that uh, this Z, because Z of course is a ring, this uh, Z uh, submodule uh, generated by the elements of the kernel is finitely generated. And in fact, in this case, uh, precisely when you, you consider this sequence F, you can uh, check that uh, it has four uh, generators which are given here, okay? Okay, so this was part two, I'm looking at my time. Uh, here I'm talking about uh, S-automatic sequences. It's, uh, it's a really quick part, it's just to say that um, uh, automatic sequences are a particular case of regular sequences. The S-automatic the S -automatic sequences were defined in Rigo, uh, by Michel Rigo in 2000. Right, and the definition is really the straightforward generalization of B automatic sequences. So a, a, a multi-dimensional sequence F uh, with images in a finite alphabet delta is S automatic if there is a deterministic finite automaton with outputs such that the, the image of N is given by the output of the state that is reached from the in initial state when you read the, the, the representation of N in your abstract numeration system S. And in our case, uh, since we work with images in K, we just consider that the uh, output alphabet is, is a subset of K. It does not really matter because I just have a, um, a finite set of images. And so what we, we can prove is that the sequence is S automatic if and only if uh, the kernel is finite. And in fact, uh, uh, let me emphasize that if D uh, is equal to one, this statement already appears um, uh, exactly in this way in the paper of Rigo and Mass in 2002. But this is indeed a new result here because we are working with a different notion of S kernel. So the proof is not uh, uh, the same. Uh, and as a consequence, it means that uh, their kernel is finite if and only if our kernel is finite. So both uh, kernels are simultaneously finite. Of course, the, the, the set of S automatic sequence has not changed. So it's normal that we get this result. Uh, and uh, in the case where K uh, is finite or is a ring, then uh, we can show that uh, automatic sequences uh, correspond to those uh, regular sequences that takes only finitely many values, right? So if F is S automatic, it's always regular. And the other way around, we need this extra, extra uh, hypothesis of the, uh, on the semi ring. So it should be either finite or really being a ring. And we get that if S, uh, if F is SK regular and takes only finitely many values, then uh, it's actually an S automatic sequence. Okay, so uh, 
I'm looking at that. Yeah. So this uh, for this part four, I think I will end with this uh, part. So uh, uh, just to mention, this part five is about synchronized sequences, and then I, I I'll go to mixing synchronized sequences and regular sequences. So. Uh, I don't think I will have time to, to present these results, but may, if you're interested, no, don't hesitate to ask me. So in this part four, I, I want to show to you how uh, I can generalize um, ideas from uh, several papers. I will mention them in a minute uh, in order to, to get automatically uh, some uh, families of regular sequences. So. In, in this context. So here uh, you can notice I focus on the, the summary ring n. So here k is either n or n infinity. n infinity is just n when you add, where you add uh, an infinity uh, element. And so you extend the, the operation uh, addition and, and multiplication in n in a natural way to take into account uh, this, um, this new element uh, infinity. Right, and uh, we say that a subset X of ND is S recognizable if the language of the representation is regular. And so, with this definition, I, I can introduce uh, the first result here. So, I will present, in fact, three results, three which I call three ingredients that allows us to come to 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 infer some some families of uh, regular sequences. So the first ingredient is the following uh, one. Uh, if X, so I have S and S prime, two abstract numeration system that are D and D prime dimensional. And if X is a subset of N D plus D prime that is S S prime recognizable, then the sequence, the D dimensional sequence here, so that is obtained by um, in this way. So uh, the image of n in nd is the number of n prime in nd prime such that, such that the pair n and the n prime belongs to s to x sorry so x your your ss prime recognizable subset uh, if you have such a sequence then you can deduce that f is n infinity regular so why do I have this n infinities? Because I don't know a priori that uh, the number, the, the, what I'm counting will be finite for each n. But if I have this extra information that f of n is always uh, included in n, that I can uh, deduce that f is actually s n regular, right? So this is my first ingredient. Counting elements within a recognizable subset will give me uh, a regular uh, sequence. A second ingredient is I want to be able to enumerate uh, elements of ND. And I want to enumerate these elements in, a S in an S recognizable fashion. So this is done really easily. We define an, enumer an enumeration ES of ND in a recursive way. So we start by fixing an order, a total order on the alphabet A. Okay, so I don't have that. Uh, yet, because uh, I, I, I consider here my d-dimensional alphabet A. And then I consider the induced radix order on A star. And I say that uh, a d-tuple uh, of integers m is less than a d-tuple n, if and only if the representation of m is less than the representation of n is in the induced radix order. Okay, so this gives me a total order on an n d. And for each n now, I, I'm saying that the, the, the uh, d-tuple n is enumerated by i. So E s of n is i if n is the ith element of n d with respect to, to this order I have just defined. And so the, the second ingredient says that the pair m n in n 2 d, such that when I compare uh, my uh, enumeration of M and enumeration of N. So here my diamond could be equality greater than or less than. These sets are all SS recognizable. I put SS because I am in dimension 2D here, right? And this is uh, uh, almost immediate by definition of my enumeration. Okay, so if I go back to my running example, I will enumerate my letters of uh, the alphabet bold A in the way 
here. It's just, I, I take an, any arbitrary order on the letter, in fact, but I chose this uh, uh, order. And then uh, you see that I will get this enumeration of n square, and it will be S recognizable enumeration of n square. So uh, this red part here is uh, the, the pair of integer that are uh, represented by a, a word of length zero. It's actually the pair zero, zero, which is represented by the empty word. This is what I, I enumerate by zero. And then in the blue part is, uh, corresponds to the pair of integer that are represented by a word of length one, actually by each of these letters here. Uh, um, uh, I have just seen here. And so uh, the, the one correspond to sharp A, the two correspond to sharp B, the three correspond to A sharp, four to A A, and so on, up to eight, right? So these are the numbers I put here. And then the green part corresponds to the parent of integer that are represented by a word of length two. And then I consider the radix order with respect to these representations, and I get these enumeration of my uh, pair of uh, natural numbers. Okay, the third ingredient is uh, the following one, and this uh, generalizes, in fact, ideas from uh, the paper of Bruyère, Ansel Michaud, and Villemer in 96, 1996, and Charlier, Ramporsal, and Chalit in 2012. And those ideas are generalized to abstract numeration systems. So we say that a predicate on N M D, so it means that I'm, I'm working in a dimension that there's a multiple of D, is S recognizable is the set of uh, uh, elements of N M D such that my predicate is true, uh, my predicate in, 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 this, uh, in this element is true, is S, S recognizable, with, where here S is repeated M times. S counts for D components, so I have M D components, so I have to repeat S M times. And so this uh, third ingredient says that any predicate on an M D that is defined recursively from S recognizable predicates by only using the logical connectives, I mean, usual logical connectives, right? Uh, the and, or, negation implies or be implication. And the quantifiers for all and existing quantifiers on variables describing eleven elements of N, D is as recognizable. And as a corollary, if uh, P is such a predicate, then the closed predicates for all X, P of X, and the existence and exist uh, infinitely many x such that p of x are all decidual. And this comes down to considering uh, the universal problem on uh, finite DFA, uh, on DFA, sorry. And uh, the, the, the empty uh, is the language of the DFA, uh, is, a, is a set of accepted words, uh, empty or not, or is the set of accepted words uh, finite or not. Right, it's just so uh, it's just easy to, to see. Okay, so I will uh, app apply this these uh, ingredients to to show that the factor complexity of um, uh, an S automatic sequence will always give rise to S regular sequence, provided that the addition is S recognizable. Right, so the addition is three uh, D array predicates x plus y equals z. So if the set of representation x, y, z such that the third component is the sum of the two, uh, the first two components uh, is S recognizable, then I can show that the factor complexity of an S automatic sequence is an S regular sequence, right? So here, uh, what do I consider as a factor of a multi-dimensional sequence? Uh, if you look at the picture, I have uh, here, d equal to 2. So it's just a rectangular factor where I specify the size of the factor. So I have S1 and S2, right? And the P here means that this factor, this gray uh, factor, uh, occur in, at position P in my uh, two-dimensional uh, infinite word. So in general, I can all, um, 
say the same for any dimension D and uh, the factor complexity uh, of uh, uh, multidimensional uh, sequence uh, over K is the function rho, which I denote rho F uh, that maps each size to the number of factors of size S occurring in F. So any position where I see a new factor, I contain uh, and, and I add these, uh, these occurrences together. Uh, I'm not sure a priori that I have a finite number of factors, but of course, if F has a finite image, as is the case for automatic sequences, then uh, I have only a finite number of factors of each size, right? And so I can say that the factor complexity will be Sn regular and not Sn infinity regular. So I will end by uh, this um, uh, proof. So it's uh, a short proof because I, I'm using the three ingredients I have just presented. And the proof resembles very much the proof we had with uh, Nahad and Jeff in the paper in 2012. I just have to adapt here to, to abstract numeration system and to a multidimensional uh, uh, framework. So let's take F be an S automatic D dimensional sequence. And uh, the first observation is for that for each size S, uh, row F of S, so this is uh, the number of factors of size S of occurring in F is equal to this number. So what is this number? Is the cardinality, so the number of P, so the position where I see a new occurrence of a factor of size S. And when I say I see a new occurrence, it means that for all position P prime that occurs before P in my order, my enumeration of ND, well, the factor I see uh, occurring in P prime differs from that of size S, differ from that uh, uh, from the one I see uh, occurring in, in position P. And this is translated by the, the, the part uh, after the implication. There exists some position uh, i less than, than my size, such that fp prime plus i is not equal to fp plus i, right? So if uh, you see that, well, by ingredient one, it suffices to prove that the set x, which is the 2D tuples SP such that in fact S, um, so I will count the number of P such that, uh, sorry, row of S, it will be the number of P such that SP belongs to X in this way, right? So I just, the, 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 the set X is just defined exactly to have this, uh, this uh, um, property. And so if I prove that my set X is SS recognizable, ingredients one will tell me that my sequence row F will be uh, N regular. So how do I prove that X is uh, SS recognizable? I will use my two other ingredients. My ingredient two say that the predicates, so I defined my uh, S recognizable enumeration of N to the D. So it means that the predicate ESP prime is less than ESP is S recognizable, right? And now what I have is I, I have combined uh, S recognizable predicates together with logical operators, which uh, existential and uh, universal quantifiers on variables of ND. And so this means that my set X is recognizable. Note that we, of course, use the fact that F is S automatic and that addition is recognizable in order to say that the predicate uh, F P prime plus I is different than F P plus I is an, F, uh, an actual recognizable predicate. Okay. So this means that X is recognizable. So uh, by ingredient one, I know that my uh, factor complexity will be Sn regular. So I think my time is over. So I will stop here. If you have any question, please don't hesitate. Yes, thank you, Emily. So, so yeah, maybe so since since you you're out of time, maybe we 
we can welcome one quick question if 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 anyone wants to is this one. paper available or is this still in progress uh, I, I didn't mention that. I, I, I should uh, show you uh, all the references also. Um, it was in the end. Uh, the, the, the paper, uh, so the, there is one part of the these results that was that is already submitted, but in the case, uh, so I had no time to, to talk about that in detail, but in the case of PISO uh, numeration system, we were able to give some more results. So we which in fact we submitted before. And uh, this uh, part of the work, so most of the things that I presented here today uh, will are still in preparation, but uh, hopefully will be um, submitted really soon, I think. So uh, we, as soon as we submit uh, the paper, we will put it on the archive. And, and if you're interested uh, quickly, we, we can send it to you, of course. <laughs>